Well, now we're starting on into part two of the Garden Talk Salon's presentation of Jeff Sonner. Learn more about evergreens and their uses in mountain landscapes. Stay tuned. Our hardiest uh, evergreen tree. It does work very well as a screen and a, and a hedge and eventually gets very large. Um, some, some of these trees here likely were planted as a hedge. Uh, say 40 or 50 years ago and they turned into these huge trees after they get beyond your ability to prune them and that's it's very common around the area to see a line of white pines they're already 80 feet tall or 60 feet tall and, uh, they're they're very hardy very winter hardy and uh, and very prunable you can prune them as a very dense dense uh, head and a great native tree uh, they just want to become a big tree, so it takes a lot of pruning over the years. Um, there are other trees that don't get as big, and that's what, probably why some of the uh, arborvitae are, are more popular in the landscape. They don't eventually tower tower over your house like a white pine does. Um, but also in the hardiness realm are the spruce trees, like this, uh, this is an oriental spruce. And around the area, you'll see a whole lot of Norway spruce, which are very good hardy tree as well. They're fast growing, um, don't tend to be quite as long lived, uh, but uh, very Norway spruce are very useful, and a lot of people use them as hedging. They also become a big tree with with age. The uh, Oriental spruce is being a softer spruce. Uh, this short, soft needles, and really pretty color. Um, there's big old ones around Highlands, so I know they do well here. Uh, Tom Harbison is a forester, lived in Highlands and planted them uh, 80 years ago. And uh, there's some fine examples around Highlands, the town Christmas tree is an oriental spruce. Um, and Tom also introduced the uh, Nordman fir. Sounds a lot like Norway uh, spruce, but this is Nordman. And this one has this new growth and is very pretty right now. Um, very long, uh, soft needles, and uh, there's huge examples of these around Highlands. The, the largest example in eastern United States is in Highlands, um, right by the Hi Highland Hiker on East Main Street, 100 and, 125 feet tall. And uh, down here at High Hampton, they have a huge one about 100 feet tall that has a label of world's largest Fraser fir. Uh, however, just between you and me, it is actually Nordman fir. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, it was misidentified actually by a, a well-known uh, forester from Clemson, not, not my father. Uh, but, <laughs> my father and I actually went out there and identified it as a Nordman because 30 years ago a different uh, adelgid insect came through the area and knocked out all of the Fraser fir much as it has happened with the hemlock. And so we knew that that one was still alive when every other one was had, had expired, and, <laughs> and we figured there must be something up. And the, the, the very uh, very close uh, difference in their cone, the cones are very similar. And, and the cones on fir trees stay up in the top of the tree, except in a storm you might find one on the ground. And so we went out there after a big storm and found some cones, identified it. So it's a very good tree for the area. Uh, beautiful tree, uh, large growing. Some requirements and, uh, for that. And they're very sh uh, shade tolerant, and that's one reason I really like I like the tree. A lot of the conifers don't like shade at all, especially these guys. I uh, really want the full sun. Whereas some of the birds, like the northern birds, very shade tolerant. They're like a hemlock growing in the understory. I think that would be a good way to sort of replace that element in the landscape. As if, you, if you miss your hemlocks, you could go in with some Nordman fir. Well, how would, would you all work? like to see some fully expressed <laughs> Nordman firs, oriental spruces, arborvitaes, everything he's been talking about in a larger size. This is all I could get through the station wagon. <laughs> and you've been asking great questions. I want to thank you all for um, entertaining him with your audio, you know, with your intention. And thank you, Jeff, so much for 
You're very welcome. Thanks for sharing. We could talk with Jeff. Will you come back and work with us again? Thanks for a while. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I would love to talk about rhododendron. Uh, for the whole afternoon. Uh, no, but, <laughs> <laughs> rhododendron is one of the, they, they want to do something different, uh, but it's all, it's hard to be very, very good screening, screening material, both the hybrid and the, and the native. Two real quick questions. Sure. What, do you have uh, any experience or point of view about John Blandy, Foxwood, or uh, vertical? Graham, Graham Blandy. Oh, Graham Blandy. Graham is right here. Grambland is a very hardy selection of, of American boxwood. It grows as a column, uh, only a couple feet wide and uh, 12 feet tall or so with age. It should be a very good plant from here. And um, this little guy. <laughs> this is uh, a, a really young example. And there's a couple of varieties of very tall, narrow boxwoods that are very hardy and work well here. And I think this is a great price at fourteen ninety nine. Graham Blandy. I believe the director of the American Boxwood Garden up in Virginia. What was the name of the white flower? Uh Maximum, it's the big leaf rhododendron. Uh, there was a question in the back. Did you have a question? Uh, question. Did you make that? Um, we have a we have a three or four arborvitae, like the one the the column, okay, and they got hit really really hard in the winter. They've gone very brown. I'm just wondering if how we could tell if it's all over if or if they can recover. The brown is not a good color. <laughs> Uh, they've not gone entirely brown, though. I'm just wondering how you can tell if they're going to recover. If there's any green in there, it will recover. Uh, it does take time and a more severe burning. Uh, cut out anything brown so okay. that it looks better. Uh, if there's anything left, it should recover. <laughs> there. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, if there's anything green, it'll, it'll continue to grow. I, I bought a clip with me. Can I show it to you later? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, can you tell them how to know if a branch is dead or not? Well, a real good uh, trick is this if it's uh, bendy, pliable branch, it usually still has some life in it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, this, even if this didn't have foliage on it, it's very flexible. And if it's uh, toasted at all or if it breaks off. But we've heard scratching the bark, if there's green underneath yeah. it. Usually, though, you just have to wait till spring. Right now, there's a lot of things putting on their growth. Uh, some things that got burned are very slow to start growing. So, you'll any day now, you should see some new, new spring growth coming out of any any live branches. And that's the best test. It's yeah. still growing. <coughs> okay. should, re should recover. And if it's in a real specimen location, it may need to replace it to a part of the landscape that's less uh, visible while it recovers. Maybe you can put something else there uh, if it's a real focal point in the landscape. Yes, ma'am. What is the blooming pot on the end? Yeah, very good question. This is our native mountain laurel, um, which is a beautiful plant on its own in nature. And uh, Richard Jane started hybridizing the uh, sheep laurel, which grows in swamps, which has a very pink flower, with the light pink or white flower, and he started getting these tremendous color variations, and this was uh, 25 years ago, and they've really come out into the trade over the last 20 years, and uh, uh, this is mountain laurel, this one I believe is Sarah, and uh, I'm sorry, this is Nip. <laughs> nip muck. <It's> a funny <laughs> name for a, for a uh, any plant uh, after the nip muck tribe is uh, what it was named after in the northeast. And uh, with brilliant red buds and pink flowers, and they really are standout, of course, in the landscape. 
and they're, they're fairly slow growers, only a few inches a year, uh, but will eventually get some height, you know, seven, eight, or even ten feet with, with many years. Some requirements for that? Are they poisonous? And, um, and therefore, I want to say resistant to deer, deer browse, but deer will eat almost anything, unfortunately. <laughs> Right, rhododendron and laurels are, are poisonous to us. And her, her comment was not to be in the smoke if you're if you're burning a, a brush pile. And the sun requirements for that plant? Um, <coughs> well, they grow well in the shade. They bloom better in the sun. So um, um, the more sun usually yields more bloom. And they mainly just like our well-drained, uh, sandy, acid soil. They're, they're quite easy to grow. <coughs> they're not generally. They're, um, the color will be good in any soil, um, any of our acid soil. Um, they're not generally available as a large plant. I, you pretty much have to start with a small one. There's, there's not many nurseries that, that grow them up to be very large. But they're they're extremely cold hardy. They grow on tops of our. 5,000 foot mountains here are completely exposed, so it's a, it's a very winter hardy plant. And, uh, and, uh, and they, they go, rhododendron and laurel go through some years that are just absolutely spectacular bloom, and other years that are a little bit more subdued, and uh, kind of an alternate bloomer almost. Yes, ma'am? the name of that variegated In the back here? That's a, a variegated Cornelian cherry, dogwood. It's a, a type of dogwood. It, it has a very different flower from the normal dogwood. Uh, a little a little yellow flower very early before before the foliage. And then you get on that variety you get the beautiful foliage all summer. It really lights up the landscape. We could um, share a lot about these at the nursery because he's got some beautiful a, a collections of variegated foliage dogwoods. They seem to be the ones that we use the most in our work as ornamental plants that look good, uh, like say eight or nine months of the year or 12 months of the year with their foliage. And the Cornus Cusa Wolf Eyes Summer Fun and what was the third, the other one? It's the Wolf Eye looking one. There's uh, several uh, variegated dogwoods of uh, of the Kusa dogwood that has the really nice flower, the big flowers. And they're in bloom right now with this foliage. It's my favorite plant. So I want to thank Jeff for introducing that plant to me because I use it in our work all the time. And we just discovered these about, I mean, in the nursery trade, which was at Jeff's, about maybe five years ago, maybe six. But I love this little plant and it will make a red fruit, but it is not a showy flowering dogwood like the others are that are blooming now or maybe a little a month ago they're, they're pretty early in the spring when there's nothing else blooming you have a, a, a yellow it's a very faint yellow bloom on there but it's very pretty because it's, it's early you're ready to see some things bloom and it has this more columnar or pyramidal upright form which we like in a garden like this small courtyard because yeah. we've really layered evergreens and variegated plants and deciduous like the um the maples to create a cocoon in this urban environment. Thank you. That was a great question. I think I think we're about ready. We need to All kind right. of go on over to your nursery. We have a couple. I'm going to thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, and before we tune out of the um, recording session, Ashley, can you please step up and go stand next to Jeff? Ashley Hagenbinder is our assistant, so to speak. She's a licensed landscape architect, lives in Highlands. She and her husband, Lawrence and Baby over here, are um, part of our team for the summer for these series. And we're delighted that Ashley can help us. And uh, she also helps me with our drawings. We're, you know, I'm a licensed landscape architect. We're happy to help you with your consultations or master plans. But I did want to introduce Ashley because you didn't really get to meet her earlier in the the morning. So thank you all thank for you. being here. Um, we can, I'm going to turn off.